There we go. Hey, everybody. Welcome. My name is Jim Ingersoll, and I'm your host. And I've got an incredible friend of mine who's my co-host, Michael Zuber. Say hello. Hello. How's everybody? And uh, today we're going to dig in a little bit deeper into building your rental portfolio the right way and some of the strategies for doing it. Michael and I are both extremely passionate about it because our rental portfolio has created freedom in our own lives where we don't have to trade time for dollars and we can um, sort of make some cash flow while we sleep. And a lot of other people are all going to work so that we don't necessarily have to uh, do what we don't want to do. And we can build long-term equity at the same time of building our, our cash flow and, and creating the lifestyle that we, that we choose to live. And uh, so it's something we're both very, very passionate about. We've both done it so some different ways along the way. Michael has been doing it as a W-2 employee for many, many years, uh, 15 years. That isn't very many, actually. And uh, whereas I've been doing this full time, I jumped out of corporate America and, and went all in. So we sort of had different paths, but ended up at the same, same point, um, about the same point in time. So, uh, Michael, I want to thank you for, for doing this with me today and co-hosting with me. It's nice to be with you. Same, uh, Jim. I, you know, I don't, uh, I don't uh, interact with lots of people that are talking real estate because I think there's a lot of people out there trying to, you know, snake oil or, or, or yeah. push an agenda. And you're one of the guys I've latched on to because we just give, right? We, and, and we're honest, right? If, if we don't right. know something or the answer may hurt someone's feeling, we, we, we still say it with care. But we're, we don't have an agenda. So uh, I, like, I like associating with like-minded people. So I, I appreciate it. And congratulations it. on your book, One Rental at a Time. It's doing really, really well. You've got a lot of five-star reviews now. Are you like happy with where you're at? Uh, yeah, it... Um, it means a lot, frankly. Uh, you know, you write something like that, never knowing if it's going to mean anything. Uh, I created it simply to create belief that it's possible. Um, but, you know, I only can share my story and I didn't know if my story would resonate, but it, it seems like it has. I've gotten um, the five star reviews mean the world to me. I read them probably once a week. Um, you know, as a self-published author, though, it's hard, right? You, uh, you constantly need to grow and, and get some more. So uh, the, the mark they talk about is 100. So, so I got to work my way up to 100 five-star reviews, one, one review at a time. So it's fun. There you go. Just like, just like your rental portfolio, right? <laughs> yeah, I guess so. <laughs> and uh, are you going to do another book? I, I am playing with one right now, but uh, I'm on the mindset. Let's, let's get this one going. Uh, I, I actually may tr take a trip in the summer and and write the next draft. We'll see. Awesome. And, and I've written two, both of mine are on Amazon, but they, uh, they are really old now. And one of them just this week, uh, I think it was my latest book was launched like this week in 2011. Oh, wow. So eight, eight years. Jogged my memory. I'm going to go back and check because time, time flies by, you know what I mean? Yes, I do. So let's talk about rental properties. What is it about rental properties um, while you're working in corporate America that, that really drew your interest? And, and what, did, yeah. what beliefs did you have when you started versus what was reality once you got going and then looking back over those last 15 years that's really made an impact? Well, so, you know, if I rewind the clock to 15 years ago, I have nothing. I have $40,000 in a Schwab account. And that's all I have to my name, right? I'm a 30-year-old guy. Uh, I made okay money in my 20s, but I blew it all. Uh, and, and uh, you know, the dot-com crash hurt, right? You know, what was over 100 suddenly became 40. And, you know, when you do that once, you don't want to do it again. So really, it became a process of elimination. Uh, I knew a couple of things. I wasn't going to quit my job. I was a six-figure earner. I was very good at what I did. And frankly, loved it. I probably would have done it for half the, half the money. Uh, that's how much I loved it. So I wasn't going to leave my day job. So that eliminated lots of things. Then I knew I wasn't going to be a real estate agent, right? I wasn't going to hold open houses. I wasn't going to be a flipper. I don't have any skills or contracting or any experience like that. And, um, you know, I wasn't going to create a company. I wasn't going to, you know, I wasn't going to be the next Warren Buffett. And, and pretty soon, being a landlord became the only thing, right? There's more millionaires created uh, with real estate. And you know, I spent a year probably buying 100 books trying to see if that was true. And, uh, and it was. So uh, it, that, that became it. And then I just tried to find a way to do it 
you know, as, as now it's called a side hustle. You know, back then it was just part time. And, uh, you know, being a landlord, you know, paying someone else to be a property manager, outsourcing things I didn't have time for was very important. So, um, you know, I wish I would tell you I had a big, great plan for where I would start and go. I didn't. Uh, I just knew I needed to do something. And pretty soon, you know, being a landlord was the only option. And, you know, from there, it just became, you know, the next property, hence the title, One Rental at a Time. That's just how my life evolved. So, so looking back now, um, obviously, you're, you're happy with where you're at. You've got a lot of doors, a lot of tenants, a lot of roofs, and a lot of mm-hmm. cash flow and equity. Mm-hmm. Would you have done anything different if you could go back? Yeah. Uh, one of the things I would have certainly done different, and I didn't, it's funny, I didn't even realize this until I wrote the book. I did not treat my cash with the, I don't know, the value it should have had. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then what I mean by that is, is I got so focused on buying cheap properties, right? Like, oh, I got a 30K discount to market, or I got a 40K discount to market. And I was happy about that. But what happens when you buy cheap, is then you have a huge make ready cost or repair cost or whatever you want to call that. And when you really start do the, doing the math on your return of your cash, it's horrible. So I should have bought what today is called turnkey properties or make or, or uh, move in ready or whatever you want to call that. As a busy professional, that would have been better for me 15 years ago because I would have treated my money with more respect. I would have been able to buy more stuff because lending was really easy back in 03 and 04. Um, you know, I could have had a lot more doors today if I would have treated my cash better. That's, mm-hmm. that's a mistake. Um, you know, I, I ended up okay, but I do kick myself for that because I just wonder what, it, what could have been if I would have doubled my properties those first, you know, five to eight years. Yeah, and we're going to talk about B, you know, we're going to talk about Burr. So B mm-hmm. is the first one, which is buy. And, mm-hmm. you know, I can't really change the initials of Burr but there's a lot in that buy segment as far as like, what is your investment criteria? Um, The 1% rule cap rates. Um, How are you going to finance these? Cause you're referring to like when you started, you were putting, you know, 20% down and getting a regular bank loan and then all of the fix up costs you had to absorb yourself. Whereas today you could probably go out there and maybe do a private money loan and then um, refinance that out when you get to the final R, right? Yeah, no, no question. And again, all of this was, um, all of it was new to me, right? I didn't hear about Burr no. until oof, 2014 was probably the first time, right? During the depth of the crash, maybe it was yeah. 13. Um, it wasn't on the radar in 03. And that was probably because bank lending was too ridiculously easy, right? I mean, literally, they were not running credit checks. They were not, at, they were not auditing financial statements. Getting bank loans in 03 was frankly too easy and thus the crash that happened later. Um, but yeah, if I would have found a way to treat my cash better, whether it was Burr or um, you know, any other thing, I would be bigger today. I'd have more units today, or I would have retired sooner. Uh, so Burr is a big deal, right? If you could find a way to do the math over a short duration, short meaning six months, to try to, to juggle either a second or a private loan or maybe a hard month, whatever that is, during the buy, repair, rent, refi stage, you can set yourself up in a much better situation. More steps, more juggling, more communication, uh, maybe some negative cash flow those first six months. But if your eyes on the prize, um, you know, Burr's a, a great way to go. Uh, and I wish I had done something like that, you know, back in 03, 04. Okay, so let's dig into that. The first B in Burr, and now Burr stands for buy, rehab, rent refi right but yep, like we were saying earlier there's a lot in each of those modules that that you need to really think through a little bit and try to get as many of them right as you can so mm-hmm. let's let's dig into buy yep if you're going to go out and buy property today let's talk about the investment criteria because it's different where you're at in california than where i'm at in richmond virginia first of all mm-hmm. you've got some more difficult choices and challenges along your path than I do. I can go to my local city very easily and buy stuff that cash flows and Mm -hmm. build equity probably slower than yours. um, But it's all a lot easier and it's closer by. 
you had yeah. to figure out like where it, where does it make sense to build that portfolio for you, and you ended up in Fresno. I did, yeah, two and a half hours away. It's uh, you know, anytime I decide to go there to look at a piece of real estate, whether it was back in '03 or today, it's still a five-hour commitment before I see one property. Right. So, you know, over time I've built teams, bird dogs and, you know, different people that will go and walk through for me. But, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a control freak. I value my money. Uh, so I will never make a, I may sign a contract before I see it, but I won't close before I see a deal. Um, so, you know, I buy a lot of property. So I'm, I'm in Fresno four times a month, if not six, um, looking at stuff. So, you know, the, you know, Today, it's a lot easier, right? Because every day is Saturday. But, yeah. you know, when I had a full-time job, it was kind of tough, right? You know, five weeks on or five days on the road, get off an airplane at midnight on Friday, and you're in the car at 4 a.m. on Saturday. You know, it's just what I had to do. Um, but, yeah, I, I had to find a market that made sense, and that was Fresno for me. Okay. So, <clears throat> let's talk about your investment criteria. And one of the questions we received, by the way, is, is the 1% rule a real thing or is it just like a myth that doesn't matter? Um, and we could both give our take on that in a second here, if that's okay. But of course. for those of you guys that don't know what the 1% rule, it means um, basically if you're all in at an investment, if you're gonna buy a house for 75 and it needs 25 and you're all in around 100, then that house should rent for a minimum of $1,000 a month. And if you do that, then my take is you're going to be in the right ballpark, but there's more to it than just that also, because taxes and insurance and stuff varies depending where you're at in the country and interest rates go up, they go down. So for me, that's like a decent starting point, the 1% rule. But one of the rentals that I'm re-renting Today, I went back and looked how much the taxes were last year, and there were $480 a year. And I, I thought, my gosh, that is really cheap property taxes. I probably should look into that particular area and try to find some more like that. Um, because even for Virginia, that is super cheap, but it really yeah. helps your cash flow a lot. So oh, what's yeah, your take on the 1% rule? Uh, so again, the 1%, well, I got to give it its props. First off, the 1% rule is how I started. Now realize this was 2003. Yeah, uh, I bought I bought my first six or eight properties, 100% on the on the one percent rule. I just didn't know any better. Uh, do I think it's still real today? Yeah, uh, is it real in Fresno today? Not really. You, you'd have to you'd have to find or create a deal. It, it can happen, but it's not as as readily available. I do know people around the country that are getting it, and you're absolutely right. You got to be careful with taxes and insurance and things of that nature. Uh, I use 1% rule today as a general guide, right? If I get close to the 1% rule, you know, it's usually a sign to dig in. Um, but yeah, it's certainly real. Uh, and it served me really well in the beginning until I learned, you know, to, to chase a different metric. But uh, it, it served me really well in the beginning. So what are some of the other metrics that we need to be aware of when you're starting to dig down, like, and start to analyze deals or figure out the best place to invest? What are some of the other things besides the 1% rule that, that you like to look at? So if we're specifically asking that question under the Burr methodology or the Burr framework, it all starts with your exit. All of this, all Burr, everything, all the five steps or four steps, whatever it is, none of it matters unless you can get out at the exit correctly. So what do I mean by that? When you're getting out of the exit of Burr, at least as I understand, most people are like, I want to keep the property, but I want to refi out of expensive debt or get my cash back and then hold this asset long-term, right? That's the goal of Burr. So in order to do that, you better have your exit wired. Now, what I mean by that is you have to know what it's going to rent for, right? If you expect it to rent for 1200 but it only rents for $950, burr is broken, right? So you've got to be conservative on your exit. You also have to know what you expect the after repair value to be. If you expect the after repair what value to be 150 and it comes in at 125, Burr broke, right? So Burr all starts with the buy, absolutely. But if you don't have that wire exit, you're not going to be happy because you're going to, best case, get less cash out because you're trying to refi out, pay off expensive debt with cheap bank debt. Um, so I think a lot of people worry about upfront 
where they had also better worry about the exit because if you get the exit wrong, you, you may not, you may not get your cash back and be able to do that final R, which is repeat. Um, so that's, that's where I think a lot of people miss is the exit is actually the most important because that's where you get to recoup your capital. You get to keep a cash flowing asset uh, and keep moving forward. So, so that, kind of start with like the end in mind, right? Invest with like, you got to know what that exit strategy is. And you're right. If you're going to go to a refi, which is the last step, you've got to know what the criteria for getting that bank loan is at the end. And so <clears throat> I hate starting like Burr with the end, but you're right. It does. You need to know that. So there's a couple ways to get to that final refi. You could, if you're W2, then, then you've got the gravy train because you can just go like conventional financing on your first four right? Mm -hmm. And it's a lot easier. But um, once you're past four, or uh, maybe you've got some other uh, issues or things preventing you from doing that, then you might need to go to a commercial loan. Yep. Okay? And I'll be, that's where I'm at. So I use commercial loans a lot. And you've got to know what that bank is going to make you have as far as the criteria to nail down your refi. Mm -hmm. And you were right. You've got to know your rent. I mean, you've got to really know how much you're going to rent it for when you buy it. And you've got to know the ARV. I'm doing one right now, Michael, and I'm, I'm getting ready to, um, I'm at the end of the burr. So I'm going to refi uh, in a few days. And it's one that I think we paid like 60 and I'm in it like 75 or something like that. Real numbers, right? Yeah. And so I had, and I knew that it would rent for nine ninety five. I had it rented, no problem. Those are that's above the one percent rule, so that's fine, yep. right? Yeah, looking good. And so to get through the refi, I was planning on it um, appraising around one hundred five, and it actually came in yesterday at one hundred and twenty five. So again, just being a little bit conservative, I knew mm -hmm. like where it had to be, which for my bank loans, I've got to have. I really want twenty five percent equity. Um, that's yeah. kind of where I'm, I'm going to be. And I've got to have positive cash flow. So yeah. um, in this case, this is a real life case study. I bought it from a wholesaler. Um, I've got strong positive cash flow because I'm all in at 75 um, and it's rented at 995. So I need to, I need to refi at 75. I paid cash. So I want all my cash back, right? Mm -hmm. In this case, I didn't do a private money loan. So in order to get all of my cash back and to be into that rental with none of my own money, I had to get 75 back. And yep. to get there, I knew I really wanted it to refi. I wanted it to appraise at at least 105. Does, does that make sense as far as like explaining this to folks on how it works with the end in mind? Yeah. And then one of the things that I would tell you um, that you said that other people should pay attention to is you knew down to the penny, if you will, what the exit had to be it had to appraise at 105. If it goes above that gravy, right, all good. Yeah. Um, but you knew what it had to be because this is so important for people doing Burr, especially if they're doing private or hard money. Um, the worst thing that could happen is you get to the exit and you don't get your money back. Yeah. Then what are you going to do, right? You're likely doing Burr because um, you don't really have the capital. And how are you going to make up that seven or eight grand, right? Burr blows up if you don't get all your cash back when you borrowed 100%. Um, so you better get really tight on that end. Uh, and then you've got to, you've got to watch market cycles, right? This, this business is changing and evolving all the time. We're not in last year's seller's market or last summer's seller's market. It's different now. Uh, at least it's different in my market. So, you know, when you buy, you've got to be able to see the future a little bit and go, okay, 90 days out, maybe 120 days out. What would happen if markets down 5%? I don't know, right? What would happen? You've got to ask these questions. I'm telling you, Burr, everybody talks about Burr going, starting with the, it's wrong. It's what Jim and I are talking about. It's getting the exit wired and making sure you have a cushion. Um, because if you can't get out, you're stuck and then Burr stops working. So start with the end in mind. Know what that rent's going to be. And, and then, then that actually plays into the next R, which is rehab. Because you've got to rehab house enough to hit your exit point. So when I was all into 75, I had to know that I added enough value to that house 
to get it to appraise high enough for me. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, so I do, I'm a little, I, neither of us are slumlords. I've realized that, you know, I love the way you say they have a special place in hell. So that's good. <laughs> they do. Uh, oh my gosh. So, but you know, I want, my goal and my niche is like nicer rentals where I can get above market rent and, and, and so on. So we'll like put granite into, into a kitchen and things like that. So then I can add enough value and get that end in mind as well. Um, okay. So that's, that is where you start, which I love. Let's, let's talk a little bit more about what areas are good areas to invest in. Before we hit record, we were talking to Stephen Martin and Stephen was saying like, you know, he's got, he's taken some in off areas he that he doesn't like as well as other areas. There's working class neighborhoods, there's good schools to consider, there's gentrifying locations. What's your take on finding the sweet spot in any market across America? Yeah, I'll answer that. And Jim, can you mute some of the other lines that have joined us? Working on it. Thank you, buddy. Uh, so what I try to do is I try to invest in markets that serve the broadest areas. So that typically speaking is your three bedroom, two bath, two, you know, two car garage, single story, bread and butter, right? If you think about the monopoly board, uh, I don't invest in park place and boardwalk, right? Typically <laughs> speaking, those are, those are not great rentals. In addition, I don't invest in those dark purple ones right in front of go. Uh, I forget what they're called. I think it's like Baltic and Mediterranean or something. Yeah. But anyways, right. So you, you got to know where you're not to go, right? I, I like to be on the second and third sides of the Monopoly board. It's kind of where I like to play. Maybe the light blue stuff uh, just before whatever that is, jail or whatever that is down there. <laughs> but, um, you know, that's where you want to be. Because, again, because I've invested in market cycles. I've invested through the run-up of 03 to 08, through the crash and back. I want to be in the part of the market that, you know, people want to move up to when the market's good. And then where people want to move down to when the market's bad, because the business cycle is real. It does happen. Yes. I know we have sub 4% unemployment. I'm sorry. It won't be there forever. No. Uh, you know, it's going to change. So um, I like to be in the part of the market that serves the broadest, uh, either as move up in good times or move down in bad times. Mm -hmm. And I think if you can, if you can look to the areas that are gentrifying in your, in your city, um, your, your equity side of your component will go up faster. So there's, there's like multiple, when you're, buying, when you're building your rental portfolio, Michael, I think there's like multiple things to be aware of. Cash flow has to be there. You, you always say, don't get eaten up by the alligators, right? Yes, sir. Given, you cannot accept ever negative cash flow long term. Can't well, let's, let, let, just on that, it's, it, but w since we're talking about Burr, Jim, I, I, cr I never bought an alligator but I created one. Yeah. When I did my cash out refi once, I created an alligator. So if you do Burr right, and let's just use your real world example, right? Yeah. You're getting 995, right? But it appraised for 20 grand more than you needed. You right. could, in theory, take out more cash and create your own darn alligator. Don't yeah. do that. Bad. Stop. You know, I could take out another 20,000 and still hit the 1% rule and still cash flow, and, and I don't want to do it. No, too close, too skin to the bone, stuff changes. I like having extra equity. Agreed. Be safe. There's sometimes where you need it later. And it's also, my goal long-term is free and clear. So, mm -hmm. like, the lower my balance, um, the closer I am to my long-term goal anyways. Someday. So, anyways. Someday. Um, but I think if you can, so cash flow has got to be a given. That's a huge a huge part of the investment criteria. We talked about the 1% rule. You've got to have cash flow, net cash flow, not gross. Mm -hmm. And then the next one is equity. So how do you how do you figure out where to buy houses where you can add value so you get instant equity, but then that long term equity as well? What's what are some you know, things you've enjoyed watching? So I'm kind of an oddball, I will admit. Uh, I do not include appreciation in any of my calculations. Mm -hmm. I know it happens. Neither do uh, I. I know, I know some of my rentals areas rent more than the other, but frankly, I don't care. I don't consider it at all. Um, if I'm going to do Burr, which I've done several times, I do want to know what the after repair value is, but that's not appreciation. That's what I'm going to raise the standard of the unit to a value. I do yeah. not say 
yeah, I want to know today's value. I'm not planning for five, 10, 20 years. It is absolutely not part of my calculation. Now, what I have done, because again, you, you've, you've got to attack this business, especially if you're in it for a while. I recently have gone back and refinanced some of my multifamilies, my duplexes, tries, and quads. Why? Because now for the first time in a decade, I can get lending again from a bank so I can get interest rates with a six on it instead of paying private money with a nine or 10 on it. So I've, I've raised my um, loan balance, LTV, to 60% because, again, I'm wickedly conservative. But I've taken the extra cash out and I've paid off a bunch of houses. Because like Jim, I want to have a big pile of stuff free and clear for the, oh, my God, this just happened again right. um, you know, situation. So um, you, know, you get to start juggling um, assets and LTVs and debts. And that's something I'm you know, really proud that we've done in the last two or three months. That's when it gets off. fun, though, isn't it? Oh, yeah, for sure. Absolutely. So, yep. you know, if you're just jumping in and you go to the absolute cheapest part of your city, um, mm -hmm. if you're living in a larger metro area, that's also potentially the location with higher unemployment and also higher crime. Yeah, your, your I get asked all flow, the time. Yeah. Your cash flow will look better, but your long, but long term, there, it may be totally flat. It may not be worth any more 12 years from now than it is today. Yeah. So there's a couple of things on that. The, the, probably the most frequent question I get knowing that I'm a buy and hold landlord and that I invest in Fresno, right? So Fresno has some areas that are, are let's just call lower, lower income. And um, they say like, where do you invest? Or they're trying to push me towards, do you buy in the slums? Which right. I don't like that word, but I, I know what they mean. And, and the answer is no. Right. And, and then they go, well, why not? So um, the, <laughs> the truth is when I started, my, my answer was, would I be comfortable by my wife going there by herself, middle of the right. day, get, you know, getting out of the car? And if the answer is no, I would never put my cash there. Now the answer is, you know, I drive a rather expensive car. Would I, would I be comfortable getting out of my car, going in and doing a walkthrough and coming back and it not being ripped off? Um, I don't invest in those areas that are unsafe. I don't, I don't care what the cash flow is. Those areas do have good cash flow. But again, I think it's Excel-based cash flow. I don't think it's a real cash flow. Those areas have higher turnover, higher evictions, uh, lower rents than expected. Turnover is crazy. And as a landlord, turnover is what kills you. Um, so I, I think too many people rely on Excel cash flow. Uh, but again, I'm not, I wouldn't, you couldn't give me a, a house in an area like that. I would sell that thing in a heartbeat. <laughs> now, I do think there are gentrifying areas. And I, and I know uh, I've had friends do better in gentrifying areas than I have. Um, looking back, I should have done probably more of that. This is areas where investors are coming through and they're rehabbing lots of houses and mm -hmm. they're, they're forcing the values up on the whole location. And then the demographic of the people living there really changed. You know, Alex Lugavoy is one of them. Yeah, absolutely. He created in his little zip code there in Richmond, his own gentrification because he yeah. started buying so many of these. And yeah, then, we're definitely, yeah, we're definitely seeing that. Well, we're seeing that in, in, uh, there's an area called Fresno downtown. It's, it's 93701. That's an area of town you wouldn't have been in 10 years ago. Right. Uh, but, but a couple of big players came in, in the last three years and, and there's over been a, over a hundred million dollars deployed in that little zip code. It's vastly different today. Goes up. If you could have, oh, it's night and day. Rents go up and values go up. Triple. Yeah. So looking so, back over the last, 15 years that I've been doing this, I wish I had probably paid more attention to like where the economic developments are. Where are the commercial developments? Where's the infusion of capital going? Um, where are all the dumpsters? And where I was flipping, I should have been holding. <laughs> and because long-term they all went up, they all went up together. And so be aware of that. I encourage you guys to, to get involved in your local community, figure out like where, where the developments are at who's coming in, who the big employers are, what's going on. Like if, if the Amazon headquarters is coming to your area, you might want to pay attention. Even if there's a Starbucks coming to your area and you can get within a quarter mile of the Starbucks, you might want to pay attention. And watch where the other investors are buying and flipping and rehabbing and dumpsters. And don't count on that appreciation, but understand the, the dynamics of gentrification as well because – It'll, it'll move you forward a little faster with increased rents 
mm -hmm. and uh, long-term values, I think. No question. So <clears throat> how important are working class neighborhoods, school districts, stuff like that for you? Uh, well, working class neighborhoods are, are number one. Uh, I generally don't look at school info. I, I, I mean, as far I mean, I do look for close to schools. Absolutely. But do I, do I invest because they're school number one or two in the area? No. Um, but yeah, schools are important as far as location or distance, right? Walking distance is awesome. Uh, I will definitely look for that because you'll, what's important for me is you may not get more rent, but what I have found is when you move a family in with young kids, they're going to stay longer. And that's what this game is, is being a landlord. If you can get somebody to stay for 10 years, you win. That's the game right there, right? No turnover for 10 years, you win. Game over. So uh, that can be important. Yeah, I do too. I love long-term tenants that stay a long time, pay me on time, leave me alone, and allow me just to be a good, a good property manager. It is pretty awesome. Hey, we had a couple. Of, we had a question or two come in. Let's grab these real quick. One, oops, there's my dog. The first one is for you. It says, is the proposed commuter train in Fresno still happening? So I think there's a couple answers to that. So for those that don't know, California has been looking at a um, high-speed train essentially connecting LA to San Francisco. Um, that's, been that's been talked about for 20 years. Uh, they did approve some funds uh, about three or four years ago to connect um, kind of the central part of that, like Fresno to the Bay Area. Uh, the new governor, uh, Gavin Newsom, came in and basically shuttered the big project, which is everybody's reading as a headline is no, it's not happening. Uh, but if you read kind of the subtext, uh, they're going to be breaking it up into different sections. So I, I, the, sh the, long, the short answer is, I don't think the government knows if it's happening or not. I think they're still trying to figure it out. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, California eventually has to have a high-speed rail, right? The fact that other countries have it and the fact that you can't get from L.A. to San Francisco um, in under six or eight or 12 hours unless you're on a plane is silly. Uh, so I think it happens. Does it happen in my lifetime? I don't know. Um, but it's, it's never boring to, to watch, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Good question. Good question. You guys can type right into your chat boxes, um, whatever's on your mind about rentals. So that's, that's buy. But, you know, when you buy, you've also got to know how you're going to fund. So there's no F in Burr. <laughs> but, you know, I think before you – you get so excited about doing rehab um you should you should pull out your financial calculator first right pull mm -hmm. out your financial calculator before you start ordering your dumpster because you've got to know how you're going if you want to buy with confidence and you want to shop by being a discount home buyer and finding off-market deals you've really got to know how you're going to finance that property if you've got cash then it's super easy just stroke the check wire the money and you're done. If you're W-2 and you're going to get a conventional loan, then you need to understand how the terms of that loan work and what it takes to get it. Um, now, if you're going to, uh, maybe you're going to use private money, then you've got to have some private money partners set up so that, that when you sign a contract um, with, with a realtor, a wholesaler, or direct to a seller, you know that you can close. So Michael, what, what is your take on over the years in building a rental portfolio on the front end purchase? Mm -hmm. uh, what are some of the better ways you've seen people do it? So, you know, I, um, I leveraged both hard and private money a lot during the collapse um, because there was just deals were everywhere. Uh, yeah. And I personally didn't have the capital that I have today. So I've used it extensively. Um, the key in the beginning is even before you start to go get funding, right? You ask to, for either partners or investors or, you know, whatever you want to call that is I believe you have to build a track record. You have to build, you have to become a, a source of valuable information, right? So uh, like I spent, you know, video wasn't a thing when I started, but I wrote blogs um, for a site that's now retired, basically talking about properties that I was finding. I never listed the address or anything because I was always afraid people would scoop them up and all of that. But I would write, you know, Four bedroom, two bath house on sale for 40 grand, ARV or um, repairs, I don't know, 20 grand, expected rent 1100. And, you know, I would go out and look for people to, to help, you know, fund that. So I was always giving value away. Um, and that track record, right? I, I ended up writing, 
I think 50 deal reviews and then private money started coming my way because people could see what I was doing. I would take pictures. And again, I was just, you know, I didn't close most of those first 50 because I didn't have a lot of cash. I closed a couple on my own, but I would just keep talking about deals. And that got me access to capital. Now, when you have access to capital and people say, okay, I'm willing to lend you, you have to create a structure that works, not only works for you, but has to work for the lender, right? The bank side, the, the person. So for me, it was always about, okay, I need my purchase capital back, right? I have enough to fund a couple of flips or turns a month, but I need my purchase capital back because I want to do this over and over and over again, right? I was doing Burr before it was named. So what I would do is I would go, okay, um, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Investor, if you gave me the purchase cost, which say is 50 grand, I'll pay you 10%. And back then, this is like 2010, they were earning less than 1% in a bank. So they were in first position, they went through escrow, they were named on insurance, they were the most secure thing they could. I would get my 50 grand back and then I would do the 10 grand remodel with my cash flow from my other rentals. And then I would have an asset, right? I'd be paying them $433 a month, the rent's 1100, I'm good to go. Uh, and I just did that over and over again. But again, it's, it doesn't start with the deal, it starts with sharing first, giving freely. And then people start seeing what you're doing. They're validating what you're doing. And then pretty soon, you know, I, I raised a couple of million bucks uh, from 2010 to 12 um, because of that strategy. Uh, and I was able no, to- and I think it's great. The more people you help get what they want, you'll have everything that you want along the way. That's why you and I love, both believe in giving, 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 giving. And, and it's really true. But you've got to be able to show people what you do and have integrity and character along the way, and you will begin to attract everything that you need. You'll begin to attract deal flow, you'll begin to attract private capital, and that'll allow you to more quickly build out that rental portfolio um, once you've got those private money connections mm -hmm. um, along the way. So we've covered in detail pretty good on the B. Mm -hmm. Your buying criteria, start with the end in mind, the 1% rule, cash flow, equity, and then understanding how you're gonna get out of it at the end, and then how you're gonna cover some short-term funding. So the way that my bird generally works, I don't normally pay cash like the case study I gave a minute ago. Normally I'll borrow from somebody like say 10% interest only for six months, and then um, I will go ahead, and that will be for the purchase price and the rehab cost, all my money so my return is actually infinite because I keep my own money out of it and then I create a really nice deal for somebody else at 10% which is a double digit return and knowing the rule of 72 that money doubles every seven years for them that's a strong return and that allows me to go ahead and buy the asset rehab it rent it and then get into permanent financing so that is B um, in pretty, pretty good detail. The next one though, Michael, is R. Now mm -hmm. I rehab heavily and I, get, and I get burned out sometimes. And you mentioned like, it's better to buy something that, that maybe needs a cosmetic upgrade or an easier, an easier rehab than a gut job rehab. So let's talk through that. And my goal, by the way, when I buy rental property, and I hit the R for rehab, my goal is no maintenance for five years, as little as possible. I want to keep those maintenance costs down low. So if the roof is marginal, I'm going to do it. Same thing with the systems, um, you know, electrical, plumbing, HVAC. The windows are bad. They're going to go out and they're going to be replaced. I'm going to have a nice kitchen, nice bathroom. So that my goal would be you know, I want the same tenant for a minimum of five years and I want minimal amounts of maintenance. Uh, what are some of your goals on the rehab side? Uh, the only thing I could add, I, everything you said is the exact thing. The only, the only wrinkle to all of that is I try to put in things that are um, tenant friendly. So yeah. for example, right, that's, that's laminate flooring these days. Um, yes. That's not dishwashers, not garbage disposals. Uh, I've made that mistake a couple of times in my markets and I've actually removed them because the amount of maintenance calls I got for, you know, somebody sticking a chicken bone or something down a garbage disposal. So um, maybe it's just the section of the part of the market I was renting to. Fine. You could say that. Uh, but sometimes you can over improve a property 
uh, and think you're doing something nice for a tenant, uh, but ends up coming back to bite you. So I mean, that's the only thing I would add other than that. So you know, I don't do garbage disposals. I don't do ceiling fans either. I always feel like somebody's going to jump on the bed, grab it, and go, <laughs> go around and around and around, make the fan break their head, call me, try to sue me. Whatever. Yeah. Um, so I don't do, so things like that that are breakable, I try to remove as well, but I do do dishwashers. And I've had, I haven't had many maintenance issues on them, fortunately. Um, so that's just me. So it's interesting for me to hear that, that you don't do dishwashers as well. And so do you rehab, um, you know, one of the other things I'm looking at doing, and this works pretty good in the city, I'm working on a triplex. I think I told you that. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it's near the hospital and stuff um, in Richmond. It was the same one my daughter works at. And I'm going to put a bike rack in there. I think that'll be an interesting feature. I think parking helps. What are some other things that allow you to attract those right tenants that don't really cost a lot of money? Yards. Um, yeah. More importantly, um, fenced yards. Yep. Uh, you know, I, many times um, in my market, you know, there there are um, you know parts of town where fencing is not really a thing. Right? They're not they're not fenced. They're just green lawns across. Tenants want to have dogs. Usually, you know, we allow small dogs. Um, but I, I have noticed that tenants rent faster when I added just a simple chain link fence to the front yards. And the boy, the backyards have to be secure. Um, you know, uh, you know, that's imperative. And then if I do a triplex, I look for ways to create unique yards. It doesn't always work depending on the layout, but the last several I've done, I've been able to create you know, this yard's for the front tenant, this yard's for the back tenant, and over here's for the, you know, the middle tenant. Um, again, anything I can do to create separation and make it feel more like a house in a small multi, the more rent I get uh, and the longer they stay. Outdoor so those, space is important. Oh, absolutely. You know, yeah, porches, decks, you know, stuff like that. I think yep. it's really important. Totally, um, totally agree. And if you're in the city and you have off street parking, I think that always helps. Um, also, um, if you have the ability to put in unit laundry, I think helps as well. Do you? Uh, yeah, it depends on what it is. A house. Absolutely. If I'm in a multifamily, I might look for an opportunity to create uh, coin operated, right? Yeah. I get about a thousand dollars a month just in quarters. Um, <laughs> in my market, it's not bad. Uh, so that's, you know, any chance you get to make income, increase rents, do it. So thousand dollars a month is enough. Enough that if when I come to visit you, you can take some quarters and we go out to dinner. I, if you want to be paid with quarters, I got a couple of jars full of them. Sure, absolutely. <laughs> That's awesome, um, and I and I really like that because there are different ways to. There's lots of ways you can create additional income even beyond rent. And uh, so I think that's, that's really key. Do you guys have any questions on rehabbing? I do think it's really important. I shared with you guys, my goal is five years, no maintenance. If I can have a tenant stay for five years and I have very little maintenance, then what does that do to my cash flow? Can you guys see how that would really help you a lot on your cash flow? It helps you avoid alligators. Maintenance is another form of alligators. And so are bad tenants, by the way. Right, Michael? Oh, yeah. No question. Yes. I would rather have a property vacant than a bad tenant. No question. Yeah, so would I. So would I. I agree with that. Um, so that is rehab. And then uh, what's the next R, Michael? Uh, that would be rent. All right. Good. It's easy to rent nice houses, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, when you when you when you fix up a property with with the eye and with the what Jim Corner highlighted, right? No repairs for five years. The granite, the laminate flooring, the new appliances, um, they're going to rent really fast, right? Secure yards, all of that. And, and in my experience, says they're going to rent faster and probably ten percent more than um, you know than quote unquote market for that configuration, right? For example, if it's a three bedroom, two bath, two car garage in my market, just average condition, you're going to get eleven hundred, maybe eleven fifty. Uh, I just rented a version of that for uh, thirteen twenty-five, right? Uh, which you know is great because that extra hundred and seventy-five dollars was, um, you know, that's all cash flow because um, I did my budgeting on the base number, right, of eleven fifty. So uh, when you do the right things in this business, it, it often comes back to you in surprising ways and surprising frequencies. So I find it really easy to rent. I just had a tenant move out. So I'm renting a property um, today, actually. Um, it's one of the reasons my phone's 
going crazy. We do our own management. You you have a property manager, so oh yeah, you could you couldn't pay me to do my own management. <laughs> yeah. No chance. Uh, I I use a manager on a couple things. By the way, that's a question we got to take from somebody. But um, I find it really easy uh, to rent property. Um, I find really good pictures helps. Good marketing always helps. Marketing's the key and the, like the core of all things in real estate, anyways. So I use an app called Rently. Um, and then I use a management system called Buildium, and then that will syndicate the property out to Zillow and everywhere else. And then the, the other really big place to find tenants I find these days is right on Facebook. So if you do that, you're going to get inundated with many, many, many people who want to see your property. And then it just becomes a screening process to go from like this many down to like, who is the one person that meets my goal for income, credit, criminal background, and then you got to get that person in. Yeah. With the goal of them staying a long time, paying me rent on time. So it's just like we're both in corporate America. I had a lot of employees. They all had a job description. So for me, I've got like a job description of mine for my tenants. Hmm. You know, pay me on time, um, take good care of the asset, and get along with the neighbors. <laughs> And leave me alone. <laughs> um, so that's sort of mine. But, you know, I know that you're using a property manager. And one of the questions that came in, uh, by the way, was what questions should you ask of a property manager? Because it's hard to find, and you know yeah. this to be true, because I know your oh. story. It's hard to find a really great property manager. Do you have any tips on that? I know you do. Yeah. Yeah. So tip number one is I would only... Now, I would only entertain a property management firm where the principal, meaning owner, uh, is a real estate investor. Um, half of my bad experiences have come from property managers where their daytime job was being a real estate agent or a broker or something else. Basically, property management was a side business for them that they used as lead generation for something else. And, you know, when the market changes, you know, that becomes very obvious, right? Uh, and um, I'll never do that again, right? Only, on, only work with property managers where the owner owns real estate. And I don't talk, I don't mean owns his house in like one rental. I mean, got a decent portfolio, right? 20, 30, 40 units. If they're in property management, I want to know they got into it because, you know, they, you know, they were running a decent portfolio. So that's the big one for me. And then the other thing is once you've sort of found that person is I wanted, I wanted to ask two questions. One is, how do you go about finding quality tenants? And that Ooh. it's always the same process, right? How do they market? How do they, how do they qualify credit checks, background checks, rental references, all that stuff. But I want to hear that. And then second, I want to ask them, how do you go about keeping great tenants? Because that's what I want, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody's going to do the upfront process or they know the answers. It's like an idiot test. But when I ask about what do you do to keep the good ones, most of them give me a blank, blank stare. They're like, what do you mean? They just keep paying the rent. And I'm like, no, do you have a rewards program? Or do you, you know, at a two year mark of no missed payments, do you do something? You know, what are you doing to reward the good ones? Because I want to keep the good ones, right? I'll spend 50 bucks on a, you know, a basket of flowers or fruit or something at their year anniversary of no missed payments or whatever it is, right? That's where I want to talk about, right? I can flush out a bad tenant, right? The eviction process is stated in law in California. So everybody runs that. I want to know what people are doing different. And that, that often in my market is what are you doing to keep good tenants? That's the, that's the question uh, that I ask a lot. Retaining them. I think it's great. That's why I said my goal is to like stay a long time. That's part of my job description. I really want them to stay a long time, take good care of the asset and pay me on time. Then the final R, and I know you got to run in a minute, is refi. And I yep. think we really covered that heavily you know, you can go into, if, you, if you're on your first floor on that journey, then just get conventional financing with a W-2 income. And if you're an investor, then you're going to want to consider to go to a commercial loan. And if you're doing multifamily, then that'll either be a commercial loan or, or some form of HUD financing, right? Yeah. Yeah. The only thing I would say on the refi side, again, we've talked about it in the front. You've got to get the exit down, but the markets change. Um, the one thing I would always tell you to do is plan for the worst case scenario, right? So in this situation of a Burr, your goal was to hold the property long-term with, with cheap bank loans. 
But whatever happens, the market freezes up, interest rates double, I don't care, something happens. You've got to make sure that worst case, you can sell the asset and pay off your private or hard money, right? That's, you know, that's, that's paramount, paying back your hard money or your private money lender. Um, so you should be able to, right? Because you should be coming in with about a 30% margin, as, as Jim has correctly highlighted. Uh, but always ask yourself that. Always, always ask what's the worst case scenario. Uh, and if you can live with that, you can sleep at night, your, your lender can sleep at night, life's good. You're going to be very successful in this business. So, Michael, at that point, then you've got a, a asset that creates cash flow for the rest of your life. Absolutely. And you've got permanent financing. You know what those those fixed costs are going to be for a long time. Mm -hmm. And then your amortization comes in and, and your equity grows automatically with with just amortization. Screw yep. all the appreciation, like you said. Yep. Yep. You're going to owe less every month. And eventually that loan is gone. Amen. You're That's free and clear. And then then your cash flow goes from like here to here. Right. It's amazing. It's amazing what happens, right? I have an unfair advantage sitting in the catbird seat 16 years in. Um, cash flow doesn't really feel like much the first five or eight years. Agreed. Uh, but right around the 10 year mark, you're like, oh my God, you know, something's different, right? More money's coming in than expected. So, um, you know, that's one of the things that buy and hold doesn't get a lot of joy. It's not sexy, right? It doesn't have those stacks of hundred dollar bills that people flash on Facebook right. and Instagram. <laughs> but you know, I can point at my net worth and go, look at, look at over here. That's, you know, tax free stuff I can borrow against, you know, I don't have, it's not active income. Um, but it's, it's, um, you know, people talk about tenants, toilets, termites, trouble, all that stuff. Um, I can tell you, man, the only way to long-term wealth is buy and hold holding assets, let inflation help you, uh, let taxes help you, right? There's lots of stuff you can write off 1031. There's just, there's a lot more goodness in buy and hold than people realize. Um, and that's because it's just sexier to talk about active income and flips and wholesaling. So that is Burr. And that is your, you buy the right house in the right location for the right price with the right cash flow, rehab it the right way, rent it to the right people, get into the right permanent financing and just hold it and hold it and hold it and hold it and hold it. And, and you will do very, very well. And it doesn't take very many. That's why you guys want to go to Michael's uh, YouTube channel, One Rental at a Time. Check out his book on Amazon, same thing, One Rental at a Time. Connect with him because you're going to learn a ton. Michael, I really enjoyed this today. Our one hour is up. Um, we'll do another uh, session. I was thinking one on small apartment buildings or something like that in the near future, if that sounds good to you. I will do anything you want. You're my hero. <laughs> Same here. All right, guys. Thanks, everybody. Have an awesome day. Thanks for joining us live. We really enjoyed it. I like having the small group, Michael, with people um, interacting in the chat box and things. So it was a lot of fun. I'll send this over to you and have a great day, Michael. You too. Take care. Bye. Thanks, everybody.